That was a mistake. <laughs> See if I can't get it right this time. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Uh, we're back. Episode 86 of the PHP Roundtable. Uh, this episode is about a topic that's kind of near and dear to me. Um, I've always been fascinated with how people learn to develop. Uh, for me, to kind of give you a little back story on who I am and how long I've been doing this, I, I've actually been very fortunate. I, I learned to develop using BASIC on a TRS-80 Coco computer a very long time ago. Um, I, was, I was fortunate from the perspective of my dad kind of saw the benefit of it and, and bought this stuff for me. But through all my formal schooling that, that I went through, nothing I do, do, nothing I do to t today existed. Like I couldn't have been taught what I do professionally today. The way I make a living today, I couldn't have been taught it when I was in school. Um, and so needless to say, I'm a self-taught PHP developer. I, I'm pretty much self-taught developer. I, I did do some Fortran and some, uh, Pascal and a very short stint I did at a community college. I failed tremendously at community college and, uh, I, I self-taught myself all through high school. And like I said, I'd gotten basic down and all that, but when I'd gotten into Fortran and COBOL, I realized I'm like, this is not what I want to do for a living. Like, I don't enjoy this. This is not something that interests me. And so I pretty much stopped, but I had always kind of continued to continue with my knowledge of development and coding. And I always use that to my benefit. So I got really crazy with like Excel spreadsheets and, and doing, you know, VB scripting in Excel and all this other stuff. And I had stumbled onto PHP when I was doing some stuff with an access database and a friend of mine said, Hey, you really should look at a, a true relational database. And at the time I was on windows NT and uh, it was Microsoft SQL and I couldn't afford a license for Microsoft SQL. And so this friend of mine introduced me to open source. He's like, Hey, there's this open source version of Microsoft SQL. It's called MySQL. Uh, check it out. I did some research. I found a, a class in my area that was doing a, a class on PHP and MySQL. And at the time I'm like, well, I don't know what PHP is, but uh, you know, I want to learn MySQL. So let me, let me go ahead and get into it. And then I got introduced to PHP and it, it literally changed my whole professional trajectory of what I was doing. At that time, I wasn't even doing any sort of development. I was, I was in water purification and I was not, I had no interest in doing computers full time, but I learned PHP and I remember going home and telling my wife, I'm like, this is it. This is what coding is to me. This is how I wanted it to be. And just kind of sucked my teeth in and taught myself. And this was back. I, I was fortunate in the fact that I, I kind of connected with PHP back when PHP 4 was just released. So this is in like 2000, like late 2000. I think PHP 4 was released like May 2000. And um, I, I connect, I started, you know, coding with PHP. And it was funny because I still remember seeing sites that had the extension PHP 3. And that's when I knew, I was like, oh yeah, this is the older version of PHP. I'm on PHP 4, the newer version. But I was, I was fortunate because PHP was very young. And so I learned as PHP learned and as PHP grew and as PHP matured, I was able to grow and mature with it. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if I would be able to, to pick it up. I mean, I might be selling myself short. I don't know if I'd be able to step into it and pick it up today uh, as much more structured as it is. I just like I struggled with ob object oriented programming when it was introduced into PHP. And it wasn't until I took a, a break from PHP and tried my hand at Ruby and, and Rails that I understood object oriented programming because I didn't understand Rails. And so I had to learn object oriented programming to learn Rails. And then I was able to apply that back to PHP. And for me, that's that's how I learned it. So I come back to PHP. I had a better understanding of what object oriented programming was and I continued to grow. 
So, like I said, I, I, I'm always curious of how other people have gotten to where they are in their professional careers as developers or instructors and how the next generation are, are getting there. And more importantly, what the next generation is seeing as kind of the challenges that they are trying to address at becoming developers. Like what's interesting them? What's driving them? Is it AI? Is it augmented reality? Is it, what is it? Like why why are you becoming a developer and how, how important do you think that is? So I'm, I'm excited to talk to the panel uh, today. <clears throat> um, we have a very large panel. Uh, I do want to back up a little bit. I know I haven't been very good at doing roundtables, and I have an initiative to be better at that. I've shared this several times on this show and on some of the other podcasts I do, that when um, Sammy kind of gifted me PHP Roundtable and asked me to kind of steward it for a, for a while, I was very excited because PHP Roundtable has always been such a, a kind of very important part of the PHP community for me. Uh, I probably became, became a podcaster after kind of watching Sammy and seeing what Sammy was doing. Um, so I, I was very excited, but a lot of other things happened around that same time for me. Uh, we ended up taking over operations of PHP Architect, which I'd like to thank PHP Architect for sponsoring the show tonight. Uh, and shows moving forward for as long as I work at PHP Architect, which I plan to be a very long time. Um, but uh, we ended up taking over operations at PHP Architect. I had some personal stuff going on where I was selling a house, I was moving, I had kids graduating from college. There was just a plethora of, of things piling up on me. And I had told myself that I wasn't going to stress about not being able to get to PHP Roundtable because PHP Roundtable takes a while to coordinate. You know, we come up with ideas for, for topics and we, we go out to the community and find people who are interested in talking about it. It's not just me and the regular panel getting on and talking to each other every month. We try to bring other people in. So it takes some effort to put together a panel. And I, I didn't want that to be um, an issue for anxiety and stress for me. So I, I promised myself that I wouldn't let that happen. And I did. Um, unfortunately, a year has passed probably, I think, since the last show. So I'm at a point in my life personally and professionally where this is the norm. Like everything's the norm. I don't have a bunch of different uh, things interjecting. So I'm fitting PHP Roundtable into that new norm and hoping to make this a regular thing. I, I so love this podcast. It's, it's, I just enjoy it. So hoping this becomes a much more regular thing. With that said, we have a very big panel with us today. Uh, we're going to walk through everybody. Uh, we have our regular PHP Roundtable panel people who we will introduce, and then we will introduce everybody else. So let's, let me start. I'm going to start with Sarah, uh, Sarah Goldman. One of my favorite people. Hi, Sarah. Finally, you take me out of the penalty box. I swear I, I won't put I won't promote the Everyone But Eric podcast on your show. By the way, everyone <laughs> I but appreciate Eric. that. I appreciate that. So how did you how did you get into development? What what motivated you? How did you end up where you are today? I know you're you're a little deeper in than we are at like the Old for the is, is web. The term is old. Is I'm pretty sure you're younger than I am. <laughs> but the, the language you use, you're C. I mean, C's been around since the 70s, right? 75, 76. So you, you've you been coding in C. Has Have you always been coding in C? Is that something you picked up later in life? What? Uh, yeah, no. Life? I mean, it depends on how far back you want to go. Like, if you want to talk, like, all the way back to, like, where I got started, where I got started was, was basic. It was, you know, like the most sort of fundamental it was a very popular teaching language in 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 the olden times of the early 80s um it was actually at the boys and girls club of southern california uh they had little tier uh apple twos set up in a in a little room and they taught they have memories like a big card catalog and uh you put all of your data in the little drawers 
And when you want to find out what one of the data is, you just look for the drawer that you want. You, you pull that drawer open and that's got the data inside of it. Um, when I actually got into the working world, um, I did not go to, to, to college for any of this. I had other things going on in my life that uh, did not let me go down the college route. But I did actually need to pay bills and, um, you know, buy insulin and things like that because America is a dystopian hellscape when it comes to healthcare. But we'll get on that topic later. Uh, I uh, did actually know how to use computers very well. Uh, not everybody at that time, kind of mid-90s, knew really how to use computers to their maximum potential. So I got a really sort of easy IT job that allowed me to at least be computing adjacent while I figured out how to kind of like build my life into something useful. And um, I fell into a programming role because uh, my manager died in an auto accident and my coworker who was doing programming got promoted into his role. And so we needed a new programmer and I had at least vague passing familiarity with how to write things. So I just kind of became the new programmer. I was working for the U.S. government at the time. So, you know, you can get away with that sort of thing. There's not a lot of, uh, there wasn't a high bar for getting into a programming job at the time. Let's, let's put it that way. Right. Um, so it was actually, a, You were geeky enough to, to, you look like you could do it. I could fake it. I could yeah, fake yeah. it until I made it is literally what I did. And it was, it was VBScript in, in active server pages, not ASP.net, mind you active server pages, which ran VBScript. And uh, I knew enough basic that I'm like, okay, I can make sense of this. I can copy a few examples, connect some databases to do some stuff. Bob's your uncle. Um, and that was right at the time, um, just browsing around the internet, I found PHP. And PHP was just, God, it was so much easier to work with than ASP. ASP, like I could get things done, but the idioms and the the way you moved it around was just such a pain in the butt. Whereas PHP just got things done. It was that, uh, to quote Terry Che, uh, it was that ball of nails that you just threw at something until it sticks. Um, so from there, PHP became my gateway drug because I'm sitting in IRC helping people use PHP because I've gotten pretty good at the scripting language and I'm pretending that makes me a programmer. Uh, and somebody asked me some silly question about, well, how do I do logarithms in a base other than 10 or E, which is all PHP offers. I'm like, oh, that's math. I know math. Just do this. I'm like, oh, how come I can't do that as an all-in-one? It's like, oh, let's build that into language then. How hard could that possibly be? So knowing next to nothing about C, I pop open the source code. I try to find the log function. I say, oh, it's PHP function, log. That's a pretty good int. And I just fake my way through building a uh, a patch out of this. And you can find this in the email archives. I'm just like, hey, I want to make your log function a little better. Would you do it? And it was just like, okay, merged. And then the next one was like, hey, you know what? You've got another patch here. Have a CVS account. And, and just what, start. What just, version of PHP was that? Uh, that was 3.018, I want to say. Wow. Um, okay. 3.018 was the first one I was using. This might have been 4.0 something. I'm not sure. Um, but it's just been this, this avalanching sort of like falling into the next thing. And the next thing, and cause before you know it, like, oh, okay. I get the idioms of C now I can figure out how to do this. And it's just reading documentation and reading RFCs. And it's like, oh, well, I need, I, I want to do C plus plus now. So, uh, let's fake our, fake it until we make it in C plus plus. And you know, next thing you know, um, I, you know, I, I'm getting Next played by you, Yahoo you got, and Facebook. You got code, and, code up on Mars. I, I, I <laughs> <laughs> yes, you bring this up because you're jealous of it. Um, I, I, have, I am so envious of that. That's that's like such a, like, how many people? It is, it is bizarre to think about, right? Um, yeah. I, I had a patch. I put in a tiny little patch to curl. And because they use curl in the Perseverance uh, helicopter, Insight helicopter, rather, um, that means technically I have code that's on Mars. Works for me. You you don't yeah. have to go into the details. You just say I have code on Mars. Yeah. Could be one line. Who knows? Who cares? It's 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 a it is a minimal number of lines. Yeah, yeah. So that All that's right. how I got into programming was a whole bunch of happy accidents. <laughs> All right, let's uh, let's stay in school, school kids because that does not scale. <laughs> hey, Joe. Hello. Speaking of uh, staying in school and things I didn't do. 
we'll stay in school school and eric's story uh seems very familiar to me because it, it's very close to my story is i was working retail and wanted to get into working computers had taught myself enough basic and enough scripting language uh things that i knew i knew what a cgi bin was and i and i was actually reading through the common gateway interface like rfc and spec and i had a cgi bin book and i had the cgi bible and i was all about making uh vb script do cool stuff with uh, cgi so i managed to land a job at a hair care company that had a pearl shopping cart and their whole thing was they sold hair care products online, which at in the uh, mid 2000s was something was OK. It's like, OK, you know, you weren't really fighting against Walmart and Amazon back then. So it was pretty easy to spin up a small little mom and pop dot com and sell things. Well, this place here locally uh, managed to do it very well and had several really good dot coms and had a multi million dollar business out of this off of this one pearl shopping cart that they probably could have found off of a shareware site. So. Obviously, this thing didn't scale. So one of the things that, that I was responsible for was figuring out what did scale. And the short story there is a, a custom PHP shopping cart, which turned into a custom PHP integration to other shopping carts and then consolidating multiple remote shopping carts into one order management system that would leave you begging for something even remotely close to Magento. And... You know, it's it's like I so I come into it from retail and I also don't come from come from a formal education. I, I learned by tinkering and hacking and breaking things. And I I, I learn by by configuring and, and tweaking. Uh, you can give me a book and I can read it and I'll know some things, but I, I won't be able to actually work with it until or I actually won't be able to feel like I know it until I can break it and then fix it. Cool. All right, let's bring in Mr. Release Manager of PHP 8.1 and 8.2, Ben Ramsey. Hi, Ben. Hi, I was trying to unmute myself, and I was typing M into the chat instead. Uh, hi. Um, I think, uh, yeah, I think that my story is going to be very similar to all of you. So this is so like... I, just, I, just, I want to point out real fast, if I can interrupt you, all of our stories are very similar, and all of us have gray hair, so there might be a connection. I, connection there might, here. there actually might be a connection, uh, and uh, I'll I'll bring something up about that in just a minute. Uh, but yes, uh, going way back, you can hair care um, products, Joe. Yeah, I'm going to promote my own line of hair care products in a minute. Um, no, um, going way back, I started very similarly. Um, I think uh, my parents um, kind of decided they wanted to get something for me, uh, kind of like what you were talking about, Eric. And so they got, <laughs> they got me an Atari 400. I don't know if anyone knows what that is, but, uh, it was a keyboard with a little cartridge thing and they made two versions of it. Uh, there was the 400 and the 800, the 800 had actual like, uh, keys and the 400 was like like a flat pad. It looked like a McDonald's. Um, well, they don't do these at uh, fast food restaurants anymore, but they used to have these flat plastic panels with buttons you'd press, but they were just flat buttons. So that's, um, that's what it was. Um, but it had a basic cartridge and a cassette deck. Uh, and I had gotten some of those, um, um, you know, books, uh, that actually had all of the programs uh, written down on paper. And you would just write the programs, copy them, uh, type it in. And uh, I guess the first program I can really remember making, this is back in the late 80s, it was a Mad Lib generator. I, uh, I created a Mad Lib generator. And when you ran it, it would prompt you uh, at the command prompt, uh, for like, enter a noun, enter a verb, enter an adjective. And then at the very end, we take all that together and print out a story, uh, with all the variables in place. So, um, had a lot of fun with that, but if you fast forward to my high school and then early college years, I did not think I was going to be a programmer. That was never something that crossed my mind. Um, I 
oddly enough, thought I was going to work in church. And um, uh, you probably wouldn't know that from me by now, but, <laughs> um, but uh, I, uh, so yeah, that's what I was kind of heading towards. But um, when I was in high school, I started my school's first website and I was tinkering around uh, with lots of web stuff. Um, I, I enjoyed it. It was a hobby. And I guess at the time I didn't think your hobby could be your career. It just never crossed my mind. Uh, I got into college. Uh, I had some friends and one day a friend of mine said, Hey, you're, you're good with the web stuff. I actually made the website for the, a band I was in cause I was in a band as, as you do. Um, and, uh, I, uh, he, he had seen that and he said, Hey, my brother is starting a, a web agency or a web company and, uh, he's looking for a programmer. So I talked to him, I started doing that. Um, I was doing what they now call classic ASP. That's what you were talking about, Sarah and Joe, where you're coding in VB script. And, uh, we were using access databases in production. Uh, as you do and <laughs> FTP to upload all that stuff. Um, and what I learned in college or what I was going to college for, uh, was an English education degree. And I ended up, one of my professors, um, gave me one of the best pieces of pieces of advice anyone's ever given me. And he was an English professor. Uh, but he was also the CTO of like the English professor association of Georgia or something. I don't know how that works, but, um, he was really big into technology at the time. And, uh, I guess he still is, I don't know, but, <laughs> uh, but he told me one day he he pulled me aside and said, Hey Ben, you're going to have to do student teaching, uh, next semester. And at this time I was already working full time at a web agency. And he said, you're gonna have to quit your job to do student teaching. And I don't understand why you would do that. He was like, you enjoy doing that. You're making money doing that. If you have to come back and teach, you can always come back and teach on a provisional basis while you're getting your certification. Uh, so he said, I would advise you to drop out of the education part of your degree and just finish the English part. The, the English literature and um, and continue doing what you're doing. So that's what I did. And uh, I haven't looked back and that, that was really great advice. Uh, I wanted to come back to the gray hair part. I, I've been giving this a lot of thought and I, I kind of do want to hear um, some of the other people who will be joining us in a minute talk about this. Um, but at the time that we that Sarah and Eric and Joe and I were coming into the industry, it was, in my opinion, I think it was much easier for someone who had no background like that to get in. And it was also very easy in small shops to do that. And, and maybe it still is today. I, I, I really don't know. Uh, but there was a lot of leeway. There was a lot of room for error and, um, and, uh, you know, screwing things up and learning in that way. And that's really kind of how I learned. Um, actually, one of my, my first experiences with PHP uh, involved me taking down our server for a week. Um, that's a long story. I can get into it with you sometime. But <laughs> but yeah, we suffice it to say, like, I decided to install it and I completely screwed up Apache's configuration settings. Um, I didn't know what I was doing, uh, but, and we had clients whose websites were being served from that server. It was a production server. So, um, but I continued to work there for a few more years. And it was kind of things like that, that uh, we had, the ability to do and learn on the job as we were doing it. Um, I'm not sure what the uh, environment looks like these days for people coming in. Uh, I know that there's lots of coding boot camps and that kind of stuff uh, to help people get started, maybe to give them that 
that ex that early kind of experimentation and failure um, uh, experience, I don't know. So I, I, think I would be interested in hearing a little bit more um, from people who are in school today about that. All right. Well, let's let's move on to that. We're gonna bring on here. We we got some instructors, and then we got some young pups. And uh, some of these guys are like some of these people are very young. It freaks me out, man. Okay. So next on the panel, we're gonna bring in Ken Marks. Ken Marks is an author. He's authored a PHP web development with MySQL. He's also a contributor to uh, PHP Architect. Uh, he's done a couple of feature articles with us. And on top of all that, he is the, uh, he's teaching IT programming at Madison Area Technical College. Welcome to the round table, Ken. Thank you, Eric. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, and, uh, I am old. <laughs> I'm not a young pup. <laughs> so... So, I, the so what got is, you? Uh, what got you involved here? What what got you into development? And then what? Why would you ever think it was a good idea to teach development? I, you know, <laughs> I can you know, I, those are both loaded questions. Okay, so going back into the way back machine, what got me into development? My father was a mechanical engineer, um, and when I was ten, he brought home. I think it was a birthday present and this was back in 75 um he brought me home wait 73 <laughs> sorry anyways he brought me home a radio shack 65 in one kit google that <laughs> <laughs> so um and i think within a week i'd had done all 65 projects <laughs> and was starting to invent my own <laughs> and um that was my initial interest is i was very much into tinkering i liked building things i did model aviation as a kid um and then fast forward to my i want to say my sophomore year in high school um i was working a part-time job and i saved my money up and i bought myself a trash 80 computer you know what that is <laughs> Okay. Oh yeah. So, I, I, like I said, I started off with the Coco, man. I, I know, I know all yeah. the radio shack. Uh, so model one. Yeah. Yeah. Model one. Okay. And so I was typing in basic. I taught myself basic. I was waiting with bated breath every month for the TRS 80 magazine that came out. And, um, okay. I would, I even paid my brother to key in like a penny a line. I was, I was really That's, extorting. I, I was about to say <laughs> that the uh, Coco's had the Coco magazine, and that was like the thing. You'd go get Coco magazine, start flipping through the pages, and just copying in what was in the yep. magazine. Yeah. Yep. I love that. And saving it. Yeah. And saving it to your cassette drive. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So, um, so that really got my interest going in, in coding. My, my dad had even brought home before that this thing that looked like a paper slide rule that allowed you to create op codes, kind of assembly language like to put things together. So I really always loved the puzzle aspect of putting stuff together. And um, so you would think, you know, I knew I actually knew I wanted to be an engineer. I, uh, I did, but I hated school. I absolutely see. And so we get to the point of why would I, I would never have thought I would be an instructor, especially even 15 years ago, okay? I, that never would have crossed my mind because I was like the last person that that liked formal education, okay? And um, so I, my parents told me my junior year, if you don't screw off, you know, we'll send you to college. And of course I didn't listen to them and I screwed off. And um, so then I, <laughs> I joined the Navy instead. So I, I got electronics training in the in the U.S. Navy, um, did a long stint in San Diego. And um, I um, when I got out of the Navy, I did six years in the Navy. I got a job as a as an electronics technician and through. So I worked for various companies in so Southern California that did disc tape manufacturing for um, Digital Equipment Corporation, if you can remember them, which they're no longer around deck 
And um, I was uh, I, I was uh, doing creating a burn in chamber uh, where you had to bring up the temperature of circuit boards up and down for a whole uh, in a cycle. And I wrote this code in basic. <laughs> OK, so I knew basic. And um, and then I was like, this this stinks. I, I need to like networking is starting to be a thing. I need to learn C programming language. So I went and I took a class at the local community college, Fullerton Community College on C. And when I went to go sign up, they said, well, you need calculus before you can take this class. And I said, aren't you a community college? They said, bring a note from your employer. So, <laughs> so, I, so I brought a note from my employer and um, they said, okay, great. So I loved it. I got an A in it. And then I talked to my wife and I said, and my wife, uh, so I was newly married. She has a mechanical engineering degree. And I, I said, hey, how do you feel about me going to school? Would you put me through? <laughs> so she's like, heck yeah. I'm tired of working as an engineer in a man's world, is what she said <laughs> to me. And um, I, so I went and I got my comp sci degree. I started out at the community college. So I went the non-traditional student route. And um, I did two years at Cal at um, Fullerton College and then transferred into Cal State Fullerton and got my comp sci degree. And then uh, I started working in the in industry. Now, the interest. And so I started writing C at this other place. And then while I was going to school, I got a part time job uh, at Beckman Instruments writing embedded um, code for their blood analyzers. So that my career took me and my my father kept challenging me you should you need to get a degree to do that kind of coding and i'm like i know you can do it without the degree but it's going to be really hard to get a promotion blah 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 and he's of that gener generation so i succumbed to the pressure and i and i got my degree um and then so i worked mostly in the medical device manufacturing industry for my career mostly doing embedded development um blood analyzers uh radiation treatment planning software. And then most my recent gig before I uh, got into teaching was at GE Healthcare writing um, code for anesthesia, uh, anesthesia machines and critical care ventilators. And I left the company. I was the their business connectivity technical guy. Um, so you know, transferring medical medical connectivity um, device data to electronic healthcare records. And then um, I got, I took a Java class at the community college uh, just because I wanted to learn Java. Um, I want to say five, six years before I actually got the job. No, it was more than that. It was like 10 years. And um, I had an instructor challenge me there. He said, have you ever thought about teaching? And my response was, well, if I want to cut my salary in half, maybe I will. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I didn't think much about it until I was thinking I would do it as a step down to retirement. And so that's your next question is why would I get into, into teaching, right? Um, at GE, we, uh, so we're in close proximity to UW-Madison and they have a bioengineering program and a computer engineering, computer science program there. And so we took on a lot of interns there. And one day my boss came to me and said, hey, uh, We've got these extra interns. Do you want to take one on to be a mentor? And I'm like, sure, <laughs> I'll do that. And I was on a new connectivity project, and it was incredibly rewarding to work with these students because they were like sponges. <laughs> and um, they, uh, and so it's like I had this student, all they knew was Java. And I said, okay, I'll tell you what, write this test code because we got to do this test program in Java, but I want you to learn C. And then I just threw them a book, right? And then they would, I would meet with them once a week. I mean, I didn't know anything about teaching, right? <laughs> so it's like, uh, and then we would meet and I would see the process of how they were learning. And I would like, oh, okay, so, you know, Java, this is how you would do it in C++, you know, et cetera. So my career was mostly a C, C++ programmer. And in fact, um, you had mentioned this, Eric, you struggled with with object-oriented programming, I kid you not, it took me three tries to really understand OO because 
my head was so grounded in a procedural way of programming that I, I yep. had the hardest I mean. time really understanding the difference between an instance and the actual code, uh, the, you know, the, the template, if you will. And so when I got that, that's when it all clicked for me. So, and then I've been teaching for 10 and a half years. Um, I, I walked into PHP sort of as an accident. Um, <laughs> and my background, as you can tell, is not web development, right? So my, um, my program director said, hey, would you teach PHP? And I said, no. And why not? I was, well, I'm not a web developer. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, actually my department had said that. And then my, my program director came to me and says, you know, we teach web development. That's, you know, you got to stop saying that. <laughs> and I said, yeah, that's probably bad for him. And so he kept after me and he said, I'll send you to a boot camp. And I was like, I don't need to go to a boot camp. I need to hang out with web developers to find out what do web developers do that are different than software engineers. Nothing. It's the same thing. <laughs> and so um, I got into teaching PHP. And I got really disillusioned with like books were either really good from a pedagogical standpoint and horrible from the code perspective, or they were great from the code perspective, but they taught it in a vacuum in outside of how web development really works. And that's kind of what motivated me to, um, to write the book, uh, which I know you didn't ask me, but um, when Oscar who asked me to write the book I didn't even know who he was. I said, why would I want to write a book that some editor told me I had to write just to sell copies? And then I said, what do you do? <laughs> He's like, I'm the editor, <laughs> PHP architect. <laughs> it's, it's funny there because we go. that was, that was a, a, I've been a, a reader of PHP architect for, for years. I mean, I, I probably not too long after PHP architect was established that I became a reader. A lot of it has to do with uh, some of the things you touched on. As I was teaching myself, I found it. I found that I would go buy books, and as soon as I got the book, because we didn't have an internet back then, as soon as I got the book, like the book was outdated, and PHP Architect was like this monthly uh, magazine that everything was current, like it was current as of that month. And so I really had kind of, kind of you know gotten into that and kind of used it as like a. A, a learning guide on, on you know new cool. things in the industry how people were doing stuff and so yeah it, and to, to this day it's a fantastic resource for that yeah that's the ticket yeah everybody should uh subscribe to php architect i think uh okay let's uh let's move along next we have uh, i don't know if they're one of your students ken or not yes yeah, my, my have... student oh fantastic kaylin kaylin Welcome to the panel. Welcome to PHP Roundtable. Thank you. <laughs> so you are new to this, right? Or, or I mean, I'll let you explain, but uh, you're a student, correct? Yeah, I'm a student at uh, Madison Area Technical College. Okay. What what got you involved? Like, why, why are you going down this path? So I started... I guess it kind of started a long time ago, uh, like fifth grade, they brought out a big book of like careers. And I had an epiphany in that moment that somebody had to make video games, right? And so I was like, that's what I want to do. It's not in book, but that's what I want to do. Um, so I went and that was what I was determined to do. I started getting into code in my freshman year of high school, I think I started with like batch programming. It was the simplest thing I could find to teach myself. Um, did a little bit of HTML and then went to college for game design. Um, art. So I went into the art side. I, coding was my backup because I knew I was good enough at it. I took some web design classes, learned more HTML, CSS and JavaScript. Um, and still had it like this thing, like I fell in love with web design and I'm like, this is going to be in my back pocket in case I can't get into the game industry. Fun mm. fact, you can't get into the game industry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. So I am now sitting here, you know, I, was, I 
was out of school for like four years now and I had a job in just office assistant stuff and I'm like you know what I want to actually do something with the web stuff can't get a job without a degree so I'm going to school again to get that front end development degree to be able to be like hey I can actually do this mm -hmm. and and uh well I, let me say let me save some of those questions for for the group so okay cool all right uh let's move on uh Next, we are going to introduce. Let me let me pull up their their, their stuff. Jack, where is your where's your state? There you are. All right, let me bring you up. We have Jack. Uh, Jack, got to find your your screen. Wow, wow, our panel is filling up here. Jack, I'm going to butcher your last name. Paulivka. 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 Uh, you are the, of the clinical assistant professor at Boise State in the Games Interactive Media and Mobile. Do you pronounce that Jim? Uh, Gim. 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 Damn. I yep. mean, I had a 50-50 chance of being right and, as always, got it wrong. It's GIF, <laughs> not GIF. <laughs> Give us a little bit of background exactly. of who you are. Um, yeah, so um, my interest in computing really got started when I was in high school. My friends were really big gamers. Um, I got heavily influenced in uh, with games like Diablo 2, uh, Warcraft 3, Dota, all that stuff. Um, so when I was in high school back in 2005, 2006, that seems like such a long time ago, um, I took web development classes in high school. And then when I was off to apply for, or when I was going to apply for college, there was this uh, degree. So I'm from Wisconsin. So hey, Ken, Kayla, uh, Kaylin. Um, I actually went from uh, I went to the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point for my four year degree in web and digital media development. Um, learned HTML, CSS, JavaScript. I got to learn PHP during my junior year while I was there. Uh, I got to do a really cool internship with uh, Aaron Saray, who taught me a lot about the language, and that kind of started my trajectory to doing PHP. 2010, I finished, um, and then I got a job during the summer of 2011 doing PHP for a e-commerce uh, website in the Chicago metropolitan area called opticsplan.com. Uh, they did PHP uh, 5.3. Uh, I learned a lot about programming software development. My head just exploded. When I originally went to college, I thought I was going to be doing front end, like entering content on a website. But then I learned back end programming and I end up somehow becoming a software developer. It was it was not a, uh, a path that I was expecting. Um, after two and a half, three years in Chicago, I actually moved over to the uh, middle of Iowa to go to Iowa State University. I did a master's for a year and a half. I did human-computer interaction. My research was developing um, web systems for measuring what people know in the chemistry classroom and what sort of pictures they look at. Um, after I finished that, I worked full-time for the university, and I earned my PhD while doing it. Uh, my PhD research was in the same stuff. Um, so I had about 10 years of doing PHP there. And now I actually work for Boise State University teaching. Uh, I no longer work with PHP. I do Node.js instead on the back end. Um, so that's my experience really short and sweet. Oh, cool. There we go. Oh, God, those mute buttons. All right. All right, we have. Uh, oh. I, 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 we, we're almost an hour in, and we're still not through introductions here. But we have a couple more yeah. Boise State people we want to we want to bring on. Uh, next, we have Adam Gills, who is a student. Where are you at, Adam? Here. Right over here. Yeah, <laughs> you're a student of the Jim Gims Gims program, right? Yeah, yeah, that's correct. I am currently a junior um, within the Gim program here at Boise State University, um, and. With that, um, kind of, I'll make it short and sweet, sort of my experience. Um, but I grew up in a very small um, farm town um, during my time in high school. And with that, um, programming was not the biggest thing um, that was on people's minds when in high school. Um, but when I came to Boise State, that was sort of my introduction. So I'm fairly fresh into programming and sort of this game development industry. Um, so I would say about three years in. Um, 
found my first gray hair the other day, Ben. So uh, we're kind of <laughs> – so the stress is uh, – There will in. be more. Trust uh, me. I, pro- more. I, I can almost guarantee. But, um, yeah, so it, it's been a really fun experience. And um, something that I will say about um, just GIM in general here at Boise State University is that um, games is sort of that main appeal towards it. Um, but we're really a major that focuses on emerging technology. Um, so we, we cover a lot of different stuff, such as augmented and – virtual reality, um, but kind of what Jack teaches, we talk about also backend and front end development, um, and we do a little bit of 3D modeling. So it's a very generalist um, program and major um, that gets people, you know, get their feet wet in a lot of different industries. Um, so yeah, that's been my experience so far. Cool. And last but not least, and I'm sure I will butcher their name as well, we have Derek Pat Pite? Pite. 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 Ah, I did it. I almost had it. Almost <laughs> had it. You're another Boise State person, huh? Yes. Like Adam, I'm also a junior in uh, in GIM at Boise State. And uh, my interest in programming goes back to probably high school as well. Uh, I think that my friends and I, towards the beginning of high school, would always go on Chrome when we weren't, su- uh, when we weren't supposed to be doing anything but classwork. We would inspect, I'm sorry, inspect element and try and manipulate okay, websites nice. to do whatever we wanted. That was my first exposure to any sort of, uh, of, of programming. And it really motivated me to try and find something to do in tech. From there, I, I didn't really get to, get to experience too much programming until I went to Boise State like Adam. And now in the GIM program, I've been able to accomplish a lot and, uh, learn far more programming than I ever could on my own. Uh, and I have officially earned the title of table dropper as, uh, as in, in my, my two sick, in one of my GIM classes, I made the mistake of, uh, of dropping the entire class's table while doing an exercise, uh, just to kind of see if I understood how SQL really worked. Uh, listen, they might not all admit it, but I can almost guarantee you everybody on this panel has <laughs> dropped a table or two. So welcome to the club. <laughs> Sometimes an entire database. <laughs> I haven't got there yet, but we'll see. All right. So uh, we've gotten through introducing everybody. Now, I guess the most pressing question I have is, Boise State, what's up with your football field? Why is it blue? It is so difficult to watch your games. It's so hard. <laughs> we try to stand out from the crowd here, Eric. We're, we're trying to be unique, and we're trying to be different. Um, and sometimes the players blend in with the field, but we get over that issue, you know? It's, it's, it's just <laughs> all the time. I think that's part, part of the whole you know, thought behind it. Well, it's, it's not just a football game. It's also like a Where's Waldo kind of game. you got to find the players out on the field and just, you know, have, have some fun there. So for the people that are not too interested in football, they have a little side game. So, <laughs> so what I'm hearing so, is camouflage. Yes, it's, it's exactly. Camouflage. exactly. That makes it difficult yeah. for the uh, enemy team to, you know, get us. So Strategy. So I, I, I hear a lot, uh, and I heard it a few times here as well, um, gaming seems to be like this driving motivation for a lot of people to take up development. Just curious, like, why do you think that is? Do you think it's just like everybody has this, like, fantasy of, you know, be, be writing the next big Unreal Engine or writing the next big game or, uh, you know, because I know for me, and maybe it's, it's kind of the same thing for me. I, I remember being in junior high, and we had to sit at this. At at that time, there were no ter- terminals. You typed it in this green and white paper, and it it asked you a couple of questions. You answered it, and it kind of spat out what it thought you should do for a living, like what your profession should be. And I remember for me, it was like a police officer. Like just about everybody was like a police officer or something like that. And I remember when that happened something triggered in my brain where it's like, no, I want to know how that just did that. Like, I want to understand how that did that. Like, how did, how did it ask me questions and how did it take my response? And that kind of was the, was the genesis of me going down this, this rabbit hole of computers and programming and all that. Do you think it's like the similar thing with 
uh, the younger generation and game development. It's like, okay, I enjoy playing this game, but I really want to understand how this is happening. Yeah, I think I think I think I can jump in on that. Um, you know, as somebody that has played games his entire life, um, it, it's something that you're really drawn to, and it becomes a part of you um, almost. And and I think as somebody that consistently plays game and talking with other um, students within the game department, you kind of everybody wants to make the next million dollar IP. Everybody want to make you know the next Call of Duty or the next whatever popular um, game there is. And I, I think with that, it's a lot of some people are just really interested in seeing how everything works all together and, and wanting to break that down step by step. And some people just have an eye for it. Um, I think sort of looking at a game and being like, oh, well, maybe it can look different this way or maybe it can run different this way. It would be better this way. And, um, you know, you see that in a lot of gaming communities. Um, there's a lot of, you know, Discord channels or community Reddit pages that sort of talk about you know, this is what can be improved. Here are some people that have done it. Um, and that's done through like mod support or anything else like that. Um, and so I think I think some people just have a keen eye to it. Interesting. I, I just want to add on to that because um, you guys are both talking about like the understanding how things work and getting into the algorithms. But like games as a specific like attractor there is like, you know, nobody's going to sit down and thinking like, wow, I just... I can't wait to collate some numbers, man. Like, I just, I want to get those TPS cover sheets. Oh, yeah. Like, Is that true? Mm, that's my jam. Like, oh. very few, I won't say none, but very few people I think are really enticed by that. But we can all gather around games and the idea of uh, either, either social games because we're working with other people or even just personal challenge games where we're like, okay, I got to get that pixel to the next lineup and just that exciting thing. Um, I never really had in mind that I was going to go into game development personally. Um, but again, like, as I said at the start, like my, my trajectory really wasn't even programming for, for the longest time. It was just something connected to computers. I actually had EE uh, electrical engineering more in mind when I got started. Um, there was a game in the eighties called Rocky's boots. I don't know if anyone has ever heard of this, but it was a beautiful logic gate uh, based game. Um, but I still felt that sort of, attraction of the idea of building games uh, to the point that I uh, have this vivid memory in my head of being like 12, 13, maybe 14 years old, writing a letter to John Carmack asking for advice on how to get into game dev. And it was like on lined paper in pencil. And I had addressed the envelope in pencil and I put it in the mailbox and you never wrote me back, John Carmack. And I'm very upset about it. Games, so, are, games are an easy thing to, to develop around. Um, so I, I guess for the instructors here, uh, I, I touched on it a little bit about my journey in development and, and, you know, like when I would go get material, as soon as I got material, it felt like it was out of date. And I remember seeing that uh, when I, I did venture back into community college later in life and when I wanted to move forward with my understanding of computers, and I felt like the same way, like I felt at, at that time, all the programs were still like behind what the real world was doing with computers. How challenging do you, and, and Ken, you even touched on this as far as the material uh, you, you looked at initially. Is that still a problem? Like do these formal college sort of level programs, do they still struggle to stay current with new technology? Uh, you're muted, Ken. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. I did it again. Ah. Um, yeah, I think so. I, I think they that many still do. I, I know that there are, I mean, like the GIM program is definitely a uh, a good uh, effort, uh, you know, to move out of a traditional um, math-based approach. So computer science started from the mathematics department. And when I was going to school, they were just transferring it to the engineering. Now, uh, department, you have, the other problem is you have to jump through a tremendous amount of hoops to even get to some of your core 
200, 300 level classes. Um, like you have to take, well, you got to take a couple semesters of physics and some calculus and, you know, not everybody can, can do that. Um, not everybody is really good at that. Like I sucked at math. <laughs> and if somebody would have told me that I was going to get a math minor as a result of getting a computer science degree, I might've run from the building screaming. I mean, I basically tolerated math, um, is, is what I did. Um, so I, it's not a necessity. Like what we teach at our two year program is we don't teach a lot of theory. We teach really what they need to know. Um, and we're even like, like, do we even need to tell them that the computer is a bunch of switches with ones and zeros? I mean, we, we, we tell them that, but, uh, we just like, you don't really need to know. <laughs> and then we, we try, we get them coding, you know, they get a two years of experience in coding from day one in that program. So by the time they're ready to go to work, they've got two years experience in coding. Um, so I, the other aspect, and I think maybe this is an aspect from community, you know, and not the poo poo, the four year university, because I'm a product of that. I think in, I definitely think that some universities are doing a better job and modernizing, but I think they need to get away from this rite of passage that you need to take calculus to be able to do well. I think that many students, I was going to touch on this when you said, what is the motivator? You know, is like, is games, are game development a motivator? Yeah, absolutely. What else are motivators? Money, that's a motivator. Okay, especially for non-traditional uh, starting salaries in our area are probably about 65K, uh, 60, 65K. Um, and that's graduating from a two-year two -year school. That's good. Um, what Our students do a really good job self-selecting. I mean... Uh, the statistics I read is 2% of the population can do what we do. Uh, you have to be a good puzzle solver. I mean, maybe it's somewhere more than that, but l let's face it. If we all have friends that if we said, hey, if you ever would consider being a developer, they would run from the building screaming. They're usually pretty, you know, we have friends that wouldn't even consider doing something that, like that. But we also have friends that love solving puzzles and love doing this stuff, right? So... I try to take that motivation that a student has and try to redirect it. But getting back to your question is like, I think we could do a better job on keeping the students interest early when they, when they get into the program. I think that all of us can do a better job at that. I, th I think you hit on something really important there when you talked about the, that relationship of, of uh, math to programming and, um, I, I don't know if you said it specifically, but it felt like it was kind of underneath there is that, um, you know, understanding the, 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 the academic fundamentals of thing aren't necessarily necessary to being able to use the thing. Um, there are plenty of uh, web application developers out there who can think very critically and define, design very good systems that are good UIs who are really not pros at math. And that's okay because you kind of don't need to be for a lot of, of tasks. And I've, I've got a friend in the chat right now who knows I'm talking directly to him uh, because I had to explain to him that a number divided by negative one was a negative number. Uh, but that's okay because he's very good at the job that he does elsewhere. Uh, so it's, yeah, it's important to, to separate that academic concept of what goes into programming because like, you know, do you need to know how an NPN transistor you know, reacts and transports electrons across the, the P material. No, you don't actually need to know that. You need to know that I can iterate over this container and do stuff and that'll make it output of, of what the, the end user wants. In terms of uh, keeping up with like the latest information uh, and being relevant, um, I have an interesting story from when I uh, said, several years into my career, this is around 2005, I decided um, after going to several uh, interviews where they were asking specifically, you know, why don't you have a degree in computer science? Um, I thought, well, maybe I need one. So I, um, I started a master's program and uh, went in to, uh, to try to get, you know, a computer science degree that way. Um, I don't know, maybe if a couple semesters in, 
uh, we, I was taking a class. It was a Java class and the professor, uh, proclaimed to us, this is in 2005, uh, that Java applets were the future of web development. And I for, remember those, <laughs> but, but in 2005, they were already on the way out. Uh, and like flash was taking over the role that an applet would have had like 10 years before. So, um, I, I lost interest quickly in that program <laughs> and dropped out. Uh, and finally finished paying off the student loans last year. So, um, <laughs> so I am one, one student who decided that I, you know, didn't want to be in that program. I, I think Ken, you were mentioning that like how to, uh, something about, you know, how do, how do we keep the students kind of interested in that? Uh, so yeah, that was, that's an example of where like I lost interest then. Like I didn't think that the school could teach me what I needed to learn anymore, or I lost I guess, trust and faith in them. That, that's well, a great point. Oh, go ahead, Jack. Sorry, I was muted. I just want to say, uh, Ken, Sarah, Ben, they all make really good points. Computer science, I think about computer science on a spectrum of, of the theory and then the applied. And computer science is such a big field that you have to cover all of it. But I think a lot of the stuff that we're discussing here is on the applied side. And it's really abstracted away from what we really need to know in order to do the work we do. Um, knowing that stuff is important for sure. Um, but to get started, we don't need to start making stuff and saying like, hey, I just typed in 20 lines of code. I made something cool like a website. Or I remember when I first learned PHP, I was playing Dungeons and Dragons. I made a Rod of Wonder um, using case name. I'm like, oh my God, this is so cool. I can press... A button, and then it does a random effect for my play group. Um, and I think we need to move towards something that gets people really interested in what they're doing. Because without that, how are they going to continue learning and trying to keep up with content? Um, I think Gim does a good job of that. But we're not on the bleeding edge. Of course, we can't be because we're not developers. We do our best by trying to create an environment in which the students are more engaged with their projects because a lot of what we do is hands-on project-based and hopefully that enthusiasm encourages them to go and try new things that we may not have covered in the classroom. Um, we can do so much, but there's only a set amount of time in, in a semester, in a year, in a curriculum. Right, right. So we can try to get them so far, but then hopefully that interest will push them farther. Right. And, and that, that's a great point. I, Adam, I saw, you, I saw you had your hand up, but uh, let me just throw it out there because I, I do want to talk to the students. Uh, or, or, you know, I, I feel weird calling you all students, but I guess, you know, we, we'll, we'll keep that. I uh, keep you categorized as that for now. The students out there, uh, a couple things have been touched on. The first thing, don't, don't get discouraged for going to college. <laughs> I feel like, I feel like a lot of us are kind of leaning that way, but, uh, how do you feel about what's being said? Like, do you feel the programs you're in are, are, in a, it, it, it'll be difficult for you guys to maybe make this assessment, but do you feel like it, they are properly preparing you? Like, are you getting out of the programs what you had hoped to get out of the programs when you went down this path? Adam, since you had your hand up, let's start with you. Yeah. Yeah. I'll go ahead and start. Um, just sort of echoing what Jack was saying earlier. Um, and, and before I get into that question, but um, what I'll talk about with GIM in my experience so far is that it really facilitates uh, like a major that's for community. Um, it, it's strong um, in making sure that us as students bond together, um, whether that be doing individual projects that are outside of class time. Um, we host like game sessions in which um, we you know play video games and then we also make video games. Um, so it gets us some experience in doing um, you know, what we're actually learning in our classrooms and, you know, applying it to our own outside lives, outside of class. Um, and then I think going to your question, Eric, about um, these programs preparing us, I, I think they are, um, you know, especially um, with GIM and what I've experienced so far and it, what I've experienced in Jack's classes as a former student of Jack and as a teaching assistant of Jack, 
Um, I've seen that GIM really pushes students to, you know, work through the troubles and work through the obstacles and not be given the direct answer right away, but rather, you know, reaching out to colleagues and reaching out to peers um, to then, you know, brainstorm ideas together on how to fix a solution. You know, why isn't my code working? Um, let's not just beg for the answer right away. Let's let's talk to some people and let's see, you know, other experiences that somebody else might have had. Or let's do my own research and let's see, you know, what's this error that's popping up right now on line 97? Um, let's throw it into Google and let's check it out real quick and see what's coming back. Um, so I, I think, you know, particularly with GIM and from a student's perspective, I appreciate not being told the answer right away. Um, I feel like if I'm just given an answer or if I'm just working straight out of a textbook, um, I'm not I'm not going to learn as much. Um, it's sort of the it's sort of the pain and suffering experience that then turns into bigger lessons. Um, and yeah, that's what I'll say about um, the program so far. Derek, go ahead. To pile on top of what Adam and Jack were both saying, um, I think GIM does do a good job of preparing uh, students. And one thing that I, I think it teaches that maybe not other computer science programs would will give you the opportunity to learn is how to teach yourself and how to go into Google and spend time on Stack Overflow and read documentation and figure out a solution to a problem that you're having where if you were to just ask a teacher and like Adam was saying, get an answer immediately, what am I going to learn? I, I have to be able to have the time to try and work it out myself. And I think that's a skill that can be applied to any field in tech, uh, no matter where you go out starting from computer science. Kaylin, how about you? Um. I think the program I'm currently in is doing a better job of preparing uh, students. Um, but as a student, I have also had to develop the drive, the motivation to want to continue to do this, right? Like I didn't, I wanted to go into games. I am now in web development, why? Because I want to be able to make things. I want to be able to do things on my own. And a lot of my classes have been project based, which I've appreciated because it's a lot easier than, you know, taking a test, taking a quiz to be like, oh, do you know the information? Well, no, I don't know what every little thing is called because the vocabulary slips me, but I can write the code. I can make it work. Right. So I think it's, the way it's structured to have more application rather than theory, I think works a lot better in this case. That's great. It, it, it was funny to hear you guys talk about Stack Overflow and Google. It, it's not a huge secret, but that is so much of our life as professional developers are, is Google and Stack Overflow. I mean, no matter how good you are, you still reach for those tools to this day. And I, I, I'm i just blown away where we're going to be with that in the next year with things like chat GBT and who, who are kind of like stepping into that, like becoming the next level of that Google and Stack Overflow where chat GPT will just like write code for you if you ask it nicely enough. Um, so yeah, these are all tools that weren't readily accessible for a lot of us when we started in this industry that have really kind of changed that the entire field and made us all, we, we joke about it, right? We joke about how it, it makes us lazier developers because all we do is look stuff up, but it's given us all that, that, that ability to look at problems, realize that they are solvable, realize that these errors, you're not the only one experiencing this error. Like there's a whole stack overflow about that error that people have talked about and how to fix it. So it's interesting to hear that. Ken? Yeah, you kind of just touched on it is that, you know, you know, one way to look at things is to say, oh, people think we're lazy because we just look stuff up. But you know, you've also heard the adage that a lazy programmer is a good programmer as well. We're the best, man. Um, 
They're the best. And um, <clears throat> so when you look at a lot of the things, when you start out, like when we teach our intro to programming class, we teach them the long way to do something. And then we show them a more convenient way of doing it next, right? And uh, because we, for several reasons, A, we don't want to overwhelm them cognitively, okay? And then we want them to be able to form a connection on the abstract concepts as they're, as they're learning them, sequential logic, conditional logic, looping logic, modularization. But the other thing is that um, it's really, really important for like one of the things I, and Kayla, you've probably heard me say this in class. Uh, if, if you wanna be frustrated for a little bit, teach somebody how to use Microsoft Excel, right? If you wanna be frustrated for a lifetime, teach somebody how to program. And that's this, the, the people who become the best programmers, the rock star programmers are the one who embrace frustration. They're the people who like board games. They're the ones who like puzzles. They're the ones who like uh, who, who just can't get up until they solve that that problem, um, you know, because it just they gotta they gotta figure it out. And part of that is figuring out like when like one of the things we pro we teach our students is we don't give them the answer. We we say what's broken. How do you know it's broken? Where is it broken? How would you figure out it's broken? Um, we ask them a lot of questions. What are you going to do to isolate that, et cetera, et cetera. And so they learn to the degree they can learn and become more proficient in their debugging skills. That's the degree that they're going to be better coders. Nice. Yeah. I, I, and, and I heard, I think Kaylin mentioned motivation. I, I, I'm definitely one of those people who look at development as like an art form. And I'm always curious about people's like, how do they stay inspired and motivated to keep coding? Um, especially for our new students, uh, do you guys find that challenging yet? Like, I know for for us old timers, it, we've definitely had those moments where we've kind of feel like we've run out of steam and needed something to kind of get us going again. But I know when I first started doing this, I couldn't get enough of it. Like, I just couldn't stop. I always wanted to code. Is 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 it still like that? Like, do you just like have this passion for it where you want to continue coding or do you just kind of need that? Are you still, are you looking for like inspiration and, and how to get you to the next level? Go ahead, Galen. Um, so for me, I'm, definitely more of a creative person. So I am constantly coming up with ideas. I can't help it. It just, that's, that's how it works. Um, Don't apologize. <laughs> it just, I have, I have so many ideas, but never enough time in my life. Even if I were to make every single one to perfection, I, there's just so many things that drive me forward. So many projects, personal things that I just want to do and create. It's just, I don't have the skills yet. And I think that's what drives me is being able to do these personal projects, being able to come up with these ideas, being able to create something all my own to then drive me to be like, oh, I want to do the next thing. I can use things from this previous project that I learned to better the next thing I make. Great point. Adam? Yeah, I, I think I agree with, you know, everything Kaylin has said. Um, pretty pretty much it's it's one of those things. I'm also a very creative person and I find myself sketching in a sketchbook a lot of the times of, you know, what I want to do and what do I want to apply and how can I make something look good? Um, and so I find myself consistently thinking of new ideas um, of how I can update a website or, you know, this is, this is another website I can make or something like that. Um, but I, I agree where as a student, it's hard to find that time outside of, um, you know, courses and then also work. Um, so it's important that you dedicate time to yourself to teach yourself some of these things too, if you want to, you know, further your knowledge. Um, and so that's something that I know I um, sometimes struggle with, but I, I always find myself motivating, um, you know, individually to keep pushing forward because I want to make something better and I want to make something look more appealing. And so 
um, I just try my best to push through it. Um, yeah, this made me uh, remember um, something that that same professor I mentioned earlier who gave me the good advice. Um, he taught a class called the principles of teaching writing. And also there was like a grammar for uh, middle grades or something like that. Um, in those classes, uh, one of the things I remember learning is that um, when you're teaching students how to write, you, you don't really want to throw a whole bunch of like the grammar um, things at them. You, they don't have to be like what they write doesn't have to be perfect uh, always. And in fact, you know, when you're creative writing, you don't always follow the rules of grammar anyway, not, not to a T. But his point was really, as a student, like you just want them to write. You want to get them writing. Uh, so they journal every day. That was his big thing. Like make them journal, write a page or two every day. It doesn't matter what it's about. And over time, what you'll see happen is they will start needing to know some of those rules. And they will realize that there's new things that they need to go learn and then incorporate into what they're writing. And that's always stuck with me because I think, uh, Kaylin, um, you, you alluded to something like to, to this is that like, I don't know the skills right now. I don't, I don't have those skills right now, but I'm learning them. And as you're programming, you, you'll see things like, Oh, I don't really know how to do that, but now's the time to go, go grab that and, and pull it in and, and then assimilate it into what I'm building. So I think that that's, that's just the way people, I think a lot of people learn anyway, but um, it's, it's always like stuck with me that that kind of like students and, you know, not just students, but every, everyone's a student like lifelong, but as you're developing your skills, uh, you don't always have the skills you need right then and when you come to that point, you go off and learn it. A, a good follow-up to that is sort of what happens after that, after you've learned it, after you've implemented it. Because I think a lot of you know, mid-range and senior devs out there will recognize this. Some of the worst code that you will ever look at is the code you wrote six months ago. <laughs> and that is every six months. Yep. You look back and you're like, ah, I've learned more about what I did back then that makes me want to do this a different way or makes you want to do it a better way because it there is a feedback loop in there. Um, and if you see that, it doesn't mean you sucked six months ago. It means you've learned and you've gotten better. So it's it's a, it's a po very positive, very useful, very valuable thing. Uh, and I, and think that's, I think that's one of the things I really love about this industry is that there's always something to learn, no matter how long you've been doing it. I mean, you know, I, I've kind of gotten into event sourcing uh, over the, the last couple of projects I've worked on. And it's like this whole new paradigm for me. I, I've been developing for a, for a while now, and I, I just had never gone down this path before. And now I have. And it's like it's just like that 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 like discovery, that newness of hey, you know, why haven't I been doing this? This is this is this is you know, brings so much benefit to to development. Uh, I just love that about this industry. So yeah, um, I think I think Ken had referred to you know, lazy developers are the best developers. And that that's a very real world thing here. But it's funny he sh she brought that up because uh, I was a, I'm just a lazy person, like just in general, I'm very lazy. And that's why I kept developing uh, the, the kind of real world job that I had before I was in computers, I, it, water purification, the coding I was doing that I needed a database for was making my job easier. Uh, the, the guys who had been doing my job for a long time, you know, they knew like how to read these pressures and knew all oh, this, this, this client's pressure is getting high. So I know, I know next week I need to bring a filter, but I wasn't that good at it at the time. And so I was writing uh, applications that were, were tracking my client's pressures and tracking what supplies my client used week after week so that when I started my, my week, I knew ahead of time what everybody needed. And I was able to get my, like I turned my eight hour workday into like a four hour workday because 
I had written, I had gotten so good with my application that I had written that I was proactive on finding problems and fixing problems. And I was trying to let my job at the time, like I never even thought about making a living development, doing development. I was trying to get my job at the time to let me do that full time for everybody. And yeah, again, this was a long time ago and nobody saw the benefit of it. So I, I ended up going down another path, but yeah, I mean, it's crazy. I, and I, I, I got there because I was lazy. Sarah, you have something? Oh, sorry. No, I was just stretching my fingers, but since, since oh, you oh, stop it. Me, I, just, I just want to comment, uh, as you were talking, I had a thought on my head and, and as I'm thinking the thought, Jeffrey Davidson in the chat said exactly the same thing. And that is comment your code for your, for your future self. Uh, because you are not going to want to have to re reason out and rethink this problem later on. Um, in the code reviews I do for the, the engineers on my team, like that is usually the foundation of the feedback I give on things is like, yeah, this works for now. Make it easier on yourself. Maybe throw in one extra assert here, or maybe put in a little extra comment here, or maybe just abstract this one piece out because later on in six months, you're going to come back to this and you're going to wonder what you were doing because your assumptions will have changed. And that's why you're back in this code. Uh, and I, they say the same to me because I, it's easier to see it in somebody else's code than your own. <laughs> but yes, always think of your future self and making them do less work. So uh, Ken actually pinged me with the exact my my exact next question, which I thought thought was funny, but uh, yeah. So th this could I mean this could be to everyone, but I think I think I'm more focused on the students. What about this? process this journey this learning that you're doing what have you found frustrating like is, is there any part of it where you've been like this sucks like why why are we doing this this i hate this go ahead derek i was hoping you'd raise your hand because i was calling on you regardless mister <laughs> so i think uh, a good example is our our freshman year of in gym adam and i both started at the same time and um Talk, going back to talking about how uh, majors need to stay with current technology, we were working with Flash at the at our in our freshman year, uh, right oh, before. Wait, wait, you're, and, you're not that old. What was your freshman year that you're still working with Flash? That's the problem. Our freshman year. Was, <laughs> so two years ago, we were we were working with Flash right up until it hit the grave so we we watched as we made our project just for them them not to work anymore but <laughs> this uh, is hilarious is the challenge is to <laughs> to just know that sometimes it's futile and that you, no matter how hard you work on something something better is going to come out just a little bit ago or, or it's going to become outdated the challenge is keeping up with uh, the tech trends that are moving. Good, Adam, did you have something? Yeah, um, just to advocate a fellow Flash user, I'm just, uh, that that was something for our, our uh, freshman year. But um, yeah, I think, um, and one of the courses that we took last semester with Jack um, covered Amazon Web Services. Um, and so I, I think something frustrating that I've seen thus far, um, just throughout my journey is, working with different um, brands and IPs that utilize or have very specific set rules and guidelines. Um, both me and Derek are currently in a Swift course um, utilizing Xcode and also um, utilizing Apple and Mac's sort of coding language and system. And it is almost night and day difference compared to um, something like um, Java or HTML, something very, um, you know, interchangeable and something that you can see a lot of commonalities within, but Swift is another realm of language, I would say. Um, but when working with Amazon Web Services, we, we found that there were a lot of difficulties um, just getting used to it. Um, so I think something is just understanding um, that some things are a lot different and you kind of have to just work through the fire and kind of understand that it's going to be trial and error. And in the moment, it can be really frustrating, but in the end, it's going to be a lesson well learned. Um, kind of what Derek taught in the end. Um, yes, we did work with Flash when it was dying out, um, but it was something that 
I think taught us really the basics of programming because a lot of people that were coming into GIM that freshman year didn't really have a lot of programming under their belt. Um, this was sort of an initiation basis of like, okay, like here's sort of what we're doing with some programming and here's sort of um, different ways that you might take syntax um, and apply it to other programs that you might use later, or other languages that you might use later. Um, so it, it is really a trial and error sort of thing and something in the moment it's frustrating, but in the end, it, it's a lesson well learned. Gotcha. Um, I, I'm, I've been trying to think how I want to formulate this kind of next statement and, and it could be for the panel at large. Uh, really curious about how the new people are handling this, but you know, as we came up through the industry and as we, we grew with the web, the web was very young and, and we grew with a lot of the web, the, the solutions that were out there were limited. Right, there were only a couple. There were only a few solutions, and and there wasn't that much variation. Today, though, you mentioned Swift. We have you know PHP, which, by the way, if if you're new to this, PHP has been dead apparently for 15 years, and every year is going to be the last year of PHP. Just so you know, so get used to that. Uh, get used to that language. But you know, we have PHP. We, you know, we we have we have all these new languages coming out as well. How do you, how, I mean, I, I, people on this panel are not, well, Sarah is, is not much of a actual PHP developer, more of a, a C developer. We have Joe who does a lot of Python. These are not the new languages. You know, we have Rust, we have, there's just so much stuff out there. Is, is any of that tempting? What, what do you get, what do you use to say, okay, this is the direction I want to go, for example, Swift. Like maybe you want to do web, maybe you want to do development for Mac or for mobile. Like what criteria do you use to decide what you want to work with moving forward? Ken. So we have, um, we're answerable to our community. Okay. And so we have a business advisory um, panel that's made up of employers, right? So since we're, you know, uh, training students to work in the workforce and the taxpayers pay the bill for education, you know, or support it, our, uh, our, our stakeholders are the employers in the area. So we're going to make sure that they're trained on those coding languages that they use. So oh, for us in our area, that's going to be Java, C sharp. Okay, so that's going to be primarily because we've got a lot of insurance vendors here that that use that technology, and thankfully they've purged most of the COBOL. And um, they and then um, we do have some PHP, but also a lot of JavaScript. And it's interesting that you you know you you kind of coin it because all right, so uh, I really think that learning a new programming language. Learning your first programming language is the most difficult thing. And in my opinion, most of these programming languages, not all, but most of the ones have more in common than not. And they're always jockeying in position for, oh, Java just added that. Like when um, we were trying to do anonymous functions and not everybody had it, okay, JavaScript had it. Oh, well now Java has to add it. And then PHP has to add it. I forget what they, what PHP calls them off the top of my head, but um, the principles, the scaffolding, the what's a variable, what's conditional, what's sequential logic, what's conditional logic, what's looping logic, what's modularization, how do we design, how do we translate requirements into design, um, that kind of process of engineering a, a design solution from soup to nuts is really, really important. And once a student understands, once anybody understands that, learning your next coding language is just really easy. Um, now, I'd like to hear from other of the students who have taken that in our particular program, you're going to be exposed to three coding languages at a minimum in our degree program. So JavaScript is what we use as a vehicle to teach intro to programming. Um, we teach web development with PHP, also enterprise Java. But if you're going to learn object-oriented programming using Java, and Java and PHP are very similar, 
Um, I mean, they're, they're all C-like languages. So we, when a student graduates from our program, picking up a new language is like a no brainer um, for them. So I, I, so my answer to your question is it's not so much about the language, it's what's the tool, the right tool for the job. Gotcha. Go ahead, Jack. Uh, I just want to say one simple thing. I think the grass is always going to be greener. I think it's always going to be easy to look at another language and be like, oh, I really wish PHP had that. I wish Node.js had that. I wish C Sharp had that. And it's probably really easy to complain. But like Ken said, um, once you've got the basics are like the common threads that go between languages, swapping is going to be easier than learning your first language. And I just wanted to reinforce that. So every once in a while on the internals list for PHP, we get the request, hey, how come PHP isn't better for, let's say, building desktop GUI applications? Which I guess is a fair question. Uh, PHP is actually not great for that. Um, the reason for that is, is because we don't need it to be able to do everything. There are great languages for doing that stuff, if that's what you want to do. Although, from what I can tell, that language tends to be HTML and JavaScript inside Electron these days instead of building native apps. But that's a different horse to whip. Um, yeah, I, and yes, Ben, uh, PHP GTK is still a thing. Um, I don't know anyone who uses it. It's 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 my, almost abandoned. Where, but my very first contributions to the PHP project were working on the PHP GTK website. Oh, so you're gonna <laughs> you're gonna bring it back up to to uh, to modern then, right? No. Yeah, Joe, did, Joe, Joe, did you have something? I, I just wanted to say that, you know, what, what, one of the things that makes me or that makes PHP good for me, speaking is speaking of somebody who's been doing it for a really long time is because I've been doing it for a really long time. So if you younger folks want to be good at PHP, do it for a really long time. If it's PHP, if it's Python, if it's, if it's any other language, you know, find a syntax you don't hate and, and, and embrace it until you do has always been my, my uh, my guidance to people, and speaking of things that PHP is not good at, is take a look at around at all uh, take a look around at all of the PHP based machine learning tooling and AI type stuff. It is almost non existent because everybody's writing Python. Why are all those people writing Python? Well, that's a dirty little secret called Jupyter Labs and notebooks, which is just fancy REPLs. But right. you know, maybe maybe we're gonna bring it. Maybe we're gonna bring uh, machine learning to PHP. Uh, first, we've got to figure out our Kafka stuff, which that's a whole other PHP roundtable. But yeah, so don't feel bad when there when people tell you that PHP is dead. Don't feel bad when they tell you PHP isn't good for for this or isn't good for that, because what it is good for is making a lot of money over a long career, and that's what it's done for me. Nice. Okay, uh, we are, I mean, we're about an hour, 40 minutes into this. I really appreciate everybody hanging out with me. Um, I've got like two more things I kind of want to toss out there. Uh, and then uh, we can wrap things up if, if you guys want to. Um, I guess uh, Joe's kind of, we, we've all kind of touched on this uh, throughout the day about the, the the future, right? The machine learning, virtual reality, augmented reality, gaming. But I, I I would like to hear from everyone on the panel. Like, what do you see moving forward? What is the next big thing that coding is going to going to address? Like, is it is it AI? Is it you know? Is it is it virtual reality? What do you think the real focus with the industry is going to be, let's say, over the next three or four years? Uh, Derek, let's start with you. We're just going to go down the panel here. I think that um, machine learning definitely is going to take probably the top spot. Being able to watch right now as ChatGPT just gets bigger and bigger and see this whole AI unfold. I think a lot of people are going to jump to the conclusion that it's going to replace everyone. And in my experience, I don't feel that that's true. And in and, and seeing the code that chat GPT will get me, it seems like it's just going to become a tool. You're going to need to use uh, your own knowledge to improve upon code that is given to you by these AIs. 
And I think that being able to work with them is going to be the next step. On top of that, I also think that um, augmented reality is probably going to be the next huge thing. I feel like virtual reality may still be a little bit out uh, before it's super there, but everyone has a smartphone in their pocket and AR, uh, AR can just keep Im improving, improving from here. And it, it's, it's going to be extremely versatile to what we're going to see over the next few years uh, that AI, AR can do. I have to say, I, I never thought augmented reality got enough like uh, hype in marketing behind it because I love augmented reality. and I, I, I would love to see that. I, I, hope, I hope you're right. How about you, Ben? Um, well, I wasn't thinking of augmented reality when you first posed this question, but since Derek brought it up, I, I, I would totally agree with that. I think, um, I see a lot of opportunity for it, like in the healthcare industry and, um, really like lots of industries, uh, could benefit from, from that, um, uh, technology. Uh, I do think machine learning is, uh, just going to keep growing, um, like, we call this, we call chat GPT an AI, but it's, I mean, it's not really AI. It's machine learning that's taken a whole bunch of data and is just guessing the next output based on, you know, words. It's like a very comp complex Markov chain. So, <laughs> um, but uh, I think uh, we mentioned this in a back channel earlier. I think uh, in terms of like using that as a tool to code, uh, it's going to be the same kind of skills that you would have if you're Googling or, you know, using Stack Overflow to find code. You could just copy it verbatim and go without even thinking about it. Or you can look at it and evaluate what it is you're copying and just determine because you've got the skills to determine and decide whether that is really going to solve your problem. And that's what you're, we're going to have to be good at with, uh, with things like chat GPT, you know, writing code for us or whatever the, whatever the stuff that GitHub has now, um, that writes code. Um, I think that, you know, they're, they're not going to replace us anytime soon. Um, <clears throat> I, I guess in terms of like web development and the web industry, what I'm really, really excited about and hopeful about is um, kind of a return to those roots of um, excitement about building things on the web again. And I, I've started seeing that happen. And this is kind of another kind of like complete different side conversation, but like decentralization of services. And I don't mean like, you know, web three stuff like with NFTs and crypto, but um, I think that the last 10 years, people have gotten tired of, of these big centralized services like Facebook and, and Twitter, and they're interested in building their own little spaces on the web again and getting creative with it. Uh, so that's not really about where technology is going. I think that's where like culture is going with technology. And that's kind of what I tend to look at a lot. That's a great take. Ken, how about you? Yeah. Um, so a couple things. I, I think uh, Derek hit it on the head with um, AR and um, machine learning. I really do. Um, uh, and then uh, I told I, I agree with what Ben is saying. Um, our job, you know, I was going to say, if it didn't come up, the elephant in the room is like, people are, you know, because Everybody's talking about the shiny jet uh, chat GPT thing, right? And our colleagues, my colleagues have been talking about this as well, which I'm going to get to in a second. But um, every time a new and improved way of potentially coding or a new fourth, third generation, fourth generation coding language, the pundits have said, oh, we'll be able to replace software developers. We'll be able to replace programming. The exact opposite has happened every single time. It's only increased the need for more programmers. And uh, I mean, I remember my dad telling me this, oh, we're not going to need programmers in 10 years. And I'm like, 
uh, no, we're gonna, we have a, a tremendous shortage and, and that shortage is, that gap is getting bigger and bigger. We even have more of a shortage, which is why more people need to learn how to code. And I think you had this maybe, I don't know if this was in one of your emails or something, Eric, but it's like, we need to be teaching coding, not just at middle school, but down at the elementary uh, mm -hmm. level. We need to get people like how you do puzzles and how that translates into coding. Um, you know, Minecraft is a great vehicle. So, um, yeah, I, uh, from the instruction standpoint, you take a look at, you know, some, I've heard some instructors saying, oh, my students are just going to cheat with chat GPT. Um, I have a different philosophy on cheating. My philosophy is I'm not here to teach you. I'm here to enable your learning. I assume you're paying good money to come and get an education. So you want to you want to learn you're, you're not going to do well if you cheat you're, you're not going to cheat your way through this program anyways and you're not going to work in the industry. <laughs> so but if you are wanting to learn I'll do everything I can to enable your learning and help help you be the best uh, programmer you could be. That includes embracing tools like ChatGPT and uh, understanding from an instructional standpoint how can we use this to help people do their job better. How, what does this mean for the programming scapes, uh, space? And since we've, uh, I will tell you that almost all of our instructors on the IT staff uh, have really embraced this and we're super excited to see, to see how we can push the envelope on using this and bringing this into our classes. Cool, how about you, Adam? Yeah, um, kind of think just running down the line, everybody said some really awesome stuff and stuff I really agree with and, and kind of bouncing back on what Ken had said, um, talking about how, you know, college is a time where you're, as a student, you're paying to learn and you're paying to gain experiences and you're paying to gain knowledge. And so if you're going to cheat, you're, you're cheating yourself out of that knowledge um, and you're not allowing yourself to learn. And so I think, um, you know, in using resources like Jet, or chat GPT, um, it can provide you with a structure, but the programmer still needs to understand what's going on there, what's going on in these lines of code. And, you know, I've seen times where chat GPT is wrong and it doesn't work. And so now if you're somebody that's just simply copying and pasting, you don't know what the error is and you don't know what's going on. So it's still important that we learn, you know, these basic programming, um, you know, theories and ways to fix and resolve these errors and also learning how to debug. Um, going back to, you know, Derek's point, um, everybody's agreed with AR. I also agree with AR. Um, I think that's kind of something that is just going to continue and continue to grow. Um, I mean, I think back to, you know, 2010, um, reading comic books, we see that like AR was big back then. Um, Marvel Comics had this whole thing where there was an AR experience that could pop up a panel on your screen. And I think even now we've jump to where there are AR experiences for certain car dealerships um, that allow you to experience the car right in front of you um, and sort of get an insight as to what's going on without having to leave your place. Um, Amazon does it to where you can sort of forecast using AR in your phone to see how furniture might fit in your space or whether or not it'll look good. Um, I just think, you know, as we're moving out and throughout the future, AR is just going to grow bigger and bigger. And Kind of virtual reality like Derek was talking about, I don't think it's quite yet, quite there yet, but I think it could eventually reach a point where um, we're teaching people how to do training simulations. Um, and something that um, the GIM major has done before in the past is um, we've worked with the School of Nursing and learning medical practices using VR. Um, it's a way for people to get engaged with it and become become more or get more practice and hands-on experience rather than sitting in a classroom and looking at slideshows and reading textbooks. Um, so I think VR can eventually get there. I think AR is going to just grow and grow. And I think VR is slowly falling behind or is slowly following AR. So. Cool. How about you, Kaylin? So I think for me, there's a definite difference between what I think is going to happen and versus what I would rather happen. Um, <laughs> I feel like AI is just like NFTs and Bitcoin and everybody's going to jump on it and it's going to be this thing because everybody's hyped. But I'm already seeing the abuse of these AI technologies, whether it's chat GPT or any of the image generators that are stealing from artists and stock photos and whatnot. 
And so like it, it leaves a bad taste in my mouth really with like, these are the new things. These are the things that people want to use because like programmers, people are lazy. They want an easy way into these things that they view hard. And these AI technologies are giving that to them. Um, so unfortunately, I think that is going to be one of the bigger things. I think in the future, once the hype has died down and once it's you know not being abused, it can be a great tool for people to use once it's had more time to you know develop and not be as as new and fresh as it is um what i would rather have in is again a step into ar and vr for exactly the same reasons um adam was talking about it would be great for simulations um especially vr ar i remember when it like first started but then VR started at like the exact same time. So AR kind of got pushed to the side, um, especially in regards to games. I think, you know, games, web technology really needs to embrace AR because again, VR is just, it's not quite there yet, but AR has a lot of potential. And that's the route I, I wish we would take, but AR might still be just kind of this backlog that people are just starting to get into now, even though it's been around for a little while. You know, I would love to put together a round table around the laws in our industry. Uh, there's some really interesting stuff going on about uh, the what copyright laws could be applied to AI generated content. And I think that's going to be a real game changer uh, moving forward as well. It's going to be an interesting uh, thing to discuss at some point. But how about you, Joe? What do you what do you see? What, what are your hopes and dreams of our industry in the near future? I think a, I think a lot of what we're going to see is PHP. Sh, you know, should expect to see some kind of kind of resurgence if it if you even want to call it a resurgence. But the whole notion that it is okay again to render HTML and JavaScript on the server side, I think should we should just welcome all of these people back from all of these ridiculous JavaScript frameworks and and set them Don't back on the right back. path. We've been here for years. <laughs> right. I mean, you know, let's let's render like we did in 1999. It's totally fine. Um, so that's what, you know, all joking aside, that's one of the things where I feel incredibly validated as a, as a web developer, that that is a thing that has come full circle and I watched it. Uh, but it's really coming down to, I think the developers in the PHP ecosystem are continuing to stand on the shoulders of giants. And, and I, I know I certainly have. And the people who came before me have, and I see it continuing, and I see it continuing in, in a largely sustainable way. There's still a good community effort uh, among the different uh, social networks that you can find the community, the PHP community in. So there's still a lot of good people out there pushing uh, the good things, fighting the good fight, and sharing opinions, and and not letting the uh, the bike shedding get too much into the way of progress. And even the language itself has made huge strides in the past ten years of getting onto a regular release cycle uh, to everyone's either detriment or excitement right so php looks as looks as good as it has uh, to me ever and even though my day job isn't in php i i'm still embedded in php and uh contracting projects that i do so it's still it's still very much an active part of my daily life and, it, and it's very much a it, you know I, I look forward to people to the next generation of people coming in and discovering php oh how about you jack um, I think a lot has been mentioned about the the client or the consumer facing technology we might face. Um, but I think with all these different options like web, mobile apps, AR and VR, I think one thing that's going to be really important is that we build back end systems that can connect all these things and can be displayed on different interfaces. So I think APIs are going to make a big push. And that's going to be a way of unifying all of these systems and how they can all communicate with each other. So if we have like Alexa apps, iOS, mobile apps, traditional web, um, and we have AR, VR using Unreal and Unity and stuff, we're going to need a way of combining these different things together. And people are going to have the option of experiencing them different ways, depending on how they choose and depending on what technology they have access to. I hope from a kind of culture point of view 
like Caitlin had mentioned, um, AI is in a really interesting spot right now. Everybody is looking at it and using it, but no one's really critically thinking about it. What are what are what are the standards going to be about developing it going forward? About releasing it? What are what are governments going to do? I'm I would be really interested in what Congress. I know they take forever to get stuff done, but maybe 15, 20, 25 years from now, maybe they actually start actually developing stuff based on what maybe some states have done for uh, implementing laws and they might do something that's more universal for the country. Um, I'd be interested to see what happens from uh, regulation or even like a community grown standard point of view for how that stuff is implemented and shared. As somebody who enjoys writing APIs, I love what you just said, man. I, I don't even want to care about like the front end. I just want to help one system talk to another system and back and forth. I love that. Uh, Sarah? So yeah, Jack jumped right over the thing I really wanted to bring up and talk about, it, and that was opening the web back up. You know, the web uh, in its earliest days was just about publishing information and just making it accessible and improving the ability to communicate things. You know, um, what's his name? Tim Berners-Lee built um, the NCSA mosaic and the web server. Or am I confusing him with the other guy? I always forget their names. Whoever was built built the first web server at CERN. Uh, he did it just to keep track of all these, you know, scientific papers that they were publishing within the research community. That was it. That was the whole point of web 0.1, right? Um, and for a while, we were starting to build APIs and we were starting to say, hey, let's actually like not make it hard to interconnect these things. Let's not make it hard to for these uh, for somebody to take my service and your service and build it up into a great new service. Mashups. Thank you, Ben. That was the term that we even used for at the time. So you would create mashups. Um, and then we kind of lost our way at some point. Um, we we started to come back with this thing called the semantic web. You'd have RDF an RDFA all over the place to at least have like the hints of what data was behind there, even if you didn't have the actual data. Um, and now we've come to this place that Ben was describing much earlier of these, you know, mega uh, uh, communities, if you even want to call them that, like Facebook and, and Twitter and those things that are these walled gardens that you can't get into, that you can't just uh, trade with openly. And I'll, I'll plug Mastodon because I'm not on Twitter anymore and I think it's a much better uh, social network. It's definitely been a lower signal to noise ratio and I think that's largely because the muggles don't know how to find it. But there is a PHP Mastodon instance called phpc.social. Ben Ramsey happens to actually be the uh, the chief uh, admin for, for, for the PHPC instance, right? I think. Um, uh, but uh, the way Mastodon works is that you have a thousand different servers out there that are all just talking to each other as peers, not as anyone being in charge of the thing. So you can have one instance that has very tight moderation, you know, keeps everything PG-13, go for the kids, all that sort of thing. And you can have another instance that is a uh, green screen coming down and showing you all my work stuff. And, uh, <laughs> what it, and they'll all talk to each other and they'll all do it cooperatively and using this shared open protocol, which is to me what the web was always supposed to be. Um, that's what I want to see us get back to. And I want to see us re-embrace is that power of openness. Um, I built my entire career on open source technology and it, it drives me crazy that uh, of my day job, about 10% of our code is hidden in this private repo, repo called the enterprise repo, because those are our very special features for our very special customers. Um, and it drives me crazy that it's all out there because I think they'd pay us anyway if we still offered them support, but that's above my pay grade. Uh, and I am officially not speaking for my employer right now, uh, caveat trademark lawyer. Um, so yeah, more openness on the web, I think is the bottom line is, is I, I would very much love to see whether that happens. I think I have to take a more pragmatic approach that I think Kaylin started off with is there's what I want to see and there's what I actually think I'll see. Um, I think that uh, you're going to see Facebook continue on for a very long time, even though I think the metaverse is absurd. Um, I love that VR is finally actually becoming accessible and, and usable in a meaningful way, but 
what the hell is the metaverse? Uh, come on. Um, and I worked for the man for seven years and I still don't understand it. Um, augmented reality. Yes, that was when we first saw augmented reality coming out, I thought that was beautiful. It was like, this has the power to change the way we live our lives as people by putting the information that's relevant to us in front of us. And we saw tech like Google Glass and things like that come out that would be great integrations. And then just like with the open web, things just kind of fizzled and petered out. And, and I hope we come back to that, I really do, but I'm not holding my breath uh, because you know I've been holding my breath for 25, 30 years on VR and that is only just starting to move. So <laughs> we'll, we'll see where that goes. Okay, uh, so we are approaching the two-hour mark, but I have one more thing I want to get out there. Again, we'll run through we'll run through the panel. We'll go in reverse order this time. So, uh, people, you guys in the middle, you guys you guys are still stuck, but uh, <laughs> but we'll go the other other way here. Um, for people on this panel, for people out there watching who might be in similar positions, and this is for everybody. I want I want feedback from everyone on this. What advice would you give people in our industry interested in our industry starting in their industry what advice do you give people when you talk to them about what you do and what they should take in consideration when doing it sarah don't cry just just say say, say what's on your mind i hate this question because people do ask me this question because i have been in this industry for I mean, I don't know if, how, if you can tell how gray my hair is, but I've been in this for a while and I never know how to answer this question because like I said at the start when we were talking intros, I literally have always been faking it till I can make it. Like from, from technology to technology, from language to language, I just start with the assumption that I can probably figure this out. I can probably come up with the answer by the time I get to what I'm doing. Um, and I, I, I guess that is the only advice I can give is that, you know, um, just if it doesn't come immediately, if it's not obvious, that's okay. Um, dedicate yourself, um, decide that it's something you care about and put the time in and it, you will learn it because, you know, nobody's trying to make any of this stuff hard to learn. Well, okay, maybe some gatekeepers are, but generally people are not going to be trying to make this hard to learn, um, especially nowadays you Google something, it's 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 on Google, Google or Stack Overflow. Somebody's probably got a YouTube video about it where they spend half an hour explaining something that could have fit into a single paragraph blog post in order to get the links. Fine, whatever. The point is somebody's explaining it and it is out there and, and you can learn anything that's out there. Just give it the time. What are you, Jack? Uh, I'll put it simply, programming software development is non-exclusive club. Anybody can learn to program. Um, it may be a rockier road for other people than others, but I believe anybody can learn to program. And it's just a, a, a matter of what resources are given to you, be it pedagogically as a teacher, or whether you're teaching yourself. Everybody can be a part of this if they want to, with enough effort and enough uh, guidance or scaffolding. That's my opinion. Fantastic. I love that. That's perfect. Joe? Yeah, just to piggyback onto that, it's just a matter of, you know, being able to learn and know how you learn best to be able to pick up new skills. So, you know, once you do have that first programming language down, you should know how you learn by then. Hopefully you know that before then. So if you don't know how you learn today, focus on that first and foremost and apply that to how you learn. That's why I didn't do well in college. I just didn't learn that in that environment. But when I went home and taught myself Apache and how to write uh, CGI scripts and all that stuff, that's that was how I learned. And that's what made everything else in my career so much easier. Oh, Kaylin? Um, I think my point of advice could be best summarized as kill your darlings in that, like, don't get too hung up on one thing that you want to do right because that's going to change as evidenced by uh just about everybody here like your path isn't necessarily going to be what you think it is in the beginning it's going to change and you might go into 
web or PHP or whatever, and then you might end up somewhere else and you have no idea how you got there. So like, you just have to kind of go with the flow and don't fall in love with one thing that you think is going to be the end all be all for, for what you want to do. Nice. Adam? Yeah, um, I really enjoyed what Sarah was talking about and more so just mentioning how um, Google and Stack Overflow, these are all resources. It, it's about the time that you dedicate to researching and learning and, and it's making sure that um, you do put in that effort um, because if you really want to learn, you'll, you'll dedicate the time for it. Um, kind of something I've always told people is that um, if you're learning a new program, programming language and it's especially your first one, it, it's trial by fire. Um, it's it's going to be, if you are just the most intelligent person ever and you're able to get it right the first try, I applaud you, <laughs> but you're going to make mistakes and it's just something that comes with the process of learning. And that, that comes with anything that you do. You're going to make mistakes and it's understanding that mistakes are okay and that you will eventually figure it out. And kind of what Joe was saying, it's, it's the way that you learn about teaching yourself and learning how you learn um, and understanding that and taking it to the next steps, whether that be learning a new programming language or learning a new version of what you currently were learning before and improving on it. Um, and, and that's something I will say. And I think also in our field, um, especially for college students, in, imposter syndrome is a real thing. Um, it's something that, you know, you look at other people and you see that, you um, you see that somebody else is doing something that is light years beyond what you're capable of doing, but everybody learns at their own rate and everybody learns at their own speed. And so I, I think it's important to also keep track of your progress, you know, look at a portfolio artifact that, you know, was done six months ago and compare and look at what you've done now and, and seeing that, you know, you've improved. And that's the important thing is just making sure that you dedicate the time to learning. Okay. Well, you can. I was writing some notes. These were all great. Okay. So, <laughs> the, <laughs> so the question is, what would I tell somebody who wants to get into development? Correct. Um, my, the first thing I wanted to, would want to know is what their, what their understanding of development is, what their, you know, do they have any programming background, et cetera, et cetera. I want to know the why, um, et cetera. Um, but I would say, I mean, I'm an instructor. I'm going, to say, I'm going to say you should consider taking an introductory to programming course, you know, at your local community college if it's available and see what you think. And then along with that, a couple of other pieces of advice I would get. Think of a problem that you want to solve that can be solved um, by writing the program okay by writing a program like a web development problem because you're gonna be far more motivated motivated a case in point for me i had a COVID project i built a 3d printer from scratch and i ran into a problem um where i was like boy these parts don't fit so i had in the past tried to learn how to how to uh use cad software but i wasn't really motivated because i didn't really have a project now it's like i've got a whole couple hundred dollars worth of parts sitting on my dining room table and I can't put it together. So I need to like figure out how to redesign these parts. You, and so that was a motivator for me to learn how to use this CAD program. So, um, so being able to solve a problem. And then the third piece of advice I would give when you're going through the process is get comfortable with the idea that there is more that you do not know than that you do know. And that's okay. Just, and when you have that perspective, you're more willing. I mean, a lot of people, I, I see this, a lot of struggles like, oh, I don't want to ask for help because then I'm struggling. No, in this industry, you have to. So that, that may include finding a mentor or let me be your mentor or et cetera. You know, uh, I'll teach you how to code. Uh, I taught my kids how to code. Uh, one likes doing it and is in IT and the other one absolutely hates it. <laughs> so that would be my three pieces of advice. Fantastic. I like that. Ben, what about you? I think I'll, uh, I've got two pieces of advice. Um, and these really kind of follow along with what everyone else has been saying, but, um, and, and also like Sarah, I, I get asked this question all the time and I 
I hate it. But now I think I think I know what I'm going to say now. Um, but the first one is do not be afraid to fail. Um, in fact, uh, that is one of the best ways to learn. So go into it knowing that you're going to fail and you're just, you're experimenting. Every time you write a line of code, you're experimenting. So you're going to, you're going to check whether it works or not. And a lot of times it's not going to work. You have to figure out how it's going to work or how to make it work. Um, and then the next one is really just to follow along with that is be curious, uh, have a curious mindset because like when you're, when you're doing something like this and you're failing at it, um, you have to stay curious to figure out, you know, why is this not working the way I want it to work? And, uh, and I think Ken mentioned earlier, like, uh, something about frustrations, um, and th that's, that's what it is, right? You're, you're driven to like solve the problem. Um, and so, you know, the, the two things that come into play there, like, don't be afraid to fail. That's going to happen and be curious about it, um, to, to be able to solve the problem. Eric, bring us home. All right. Uh, I think like what Ken said, um, it's okay not to know. I think a lot of people try to jump into programming and uh, when they complete their first course or they they finish their first boot camp, they're uh, like, all right, I'm ready to take on the world. I could do anything. But it's just not the case. There's so, so, so much out there with so many different languages and so much on top of that. It's There's no way you'll know everything. And that's okay. And learning is a process. And And... To even go off uh, what he said even more, failure creates lessons. And that frustration that you get from failure is uh, better for me, at least, than when I get a project right first try. Uh, I think I learn a lot more when I have to work through and I, I have to figure out what I don't know and how I'm going to gain that knowledge. That's fantastic. All right. Uh, I will finish this up. Um, I, if I had advice, I think, I, as I've said, stated before, I've had many jobs. I've worn many hats. I've worked in many industries, not always IT, not always programming. And I think the one thing I've taken away from everything I've done is just enjoy what you're doing. Enjoy be passionate about it. If you're passionate about what you're doing, if I don't care if you're a plumber, I don't care if you're a developer, I don't care if you're a car mechanic, if you're passionate about it and if it, it, it fills you with joy to do it, you will you will find yourself surrounding yourself with other people who are passionate about that same thing. So, yes, I, I would love to see more developers. I am so excited to have spoken to the the people who are who are behind me in, in moving forward and seeing their passion. And that's my thing. Just be, make sure it makes you happy. I mean, we only get to go through this life one time and it's just not worth doing it in a miserable state. So enjoy what you're doing. If you don't enjoy it, then try to find something you do enjoy doing and, and just go with that. Uh, that would be my advice. Uh, I've been very fortunate in my life to, uh, have made a lot of friends and enjoyed a lot of things I've done, but I've not enjoyed any of them as much as I do development. And I'm very fortunate to be able to make a living doing it. And I, I appreciate that every day. All right. Uh, I did mention that PHP architect is a sponsor of this podcast. That wasn't just lip service. Um, as a thank you to all our panel members, we will I will be reaching out to you and get, getting you a code that will give you a year subscription to our digital magazine um, so you guys can continue that learning, uh, as I do as well. Um, there is a, a tech conference coming up. I, I would be remiss not to mention PHP Tech is making a return to Chicago. Uh, if you are interested, if you're watching the show, if PHP is, is something that interests you or web de development is, is something that interests you, or if you work for a company that would be interesting in sponsoring, um, go to uh, tech.phparch.com and uh, 
let, let us know or reach out to me directly, eric at phparch.com. And I can get you uh, on that sponsorship track. If you just want to purchase a ticket, you can do that through the website. Uh, we've talked about a few things. Mastodon PHP Roundtable does have a Mastodon account. Uh, it is phparch.social forward slash uh, at PHP Roundtable. Uh, we're not on PHPC because Ben kicked me off his server. Not upset about it. Not upset about it, but uh, no, I, I did have a, a long talk with Ben on how I should handle kind of the. I did not kick of you PC. off the server. <laughs> <laughs> you it's, it's because you took the RM job from him. Oh wait, no, you didn't. Oh. <laughs> but uh, but I mean, what, we're we're well over two hours into this. I can't really express to you, everybody here, enough how much I appreciate you taking the time. I hope everybody enjoyed themselves. Um, we will be doing putting together another roundtable uh, shortly. I have some ideas. I need to reach out to a few people. But uh, short of that, thanks, everybody. We're going to go ahead and end the stream at this point. Oh, Jack, go ahead. Um, I just want to say one more thing. Uh, for everybody who's interested in programming, I think it's a common occurrence that everybody at least drops a database table at one time in the career when they're not supposed to. Um, <laughs> everybody. And I'm throwing some shade at a particular person. Yes, we touched on this. Yes, we 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 all agree on that. Okay, thanks to everybody. We we've had a we we've had a pretty strong uh, viewing of this roundtable for the entire two hours. I, I've been very excited about that. So thanks for everybody for hanging out with us. And until next time, take it easy.